Welcome back, everyone. Our next session is from Valerie Lyons. Uh, we were talking earlier on uh, when Val first attended COSAC, and it's all the way back in 2002, believe it or not. Um, Val is a, a leading light on privacy um, and indeed an executive coach um, and mentor and has a master's in business leadership. So um, she brings a very particular approach to privacy, uh, which is quite different than the normal compliance approach. Uh, we're delighted to have you back at, at COSAC, Val. So you are now live, it's all over to you. Hi, so you can hear me? Super. Um, I just wanna, uh, I suppose, start by saying thanks very much for inviting me. Um, it's an absolute privilege. For those of you who are new to COSAC, you're all very welcome. Um, I've got the graveyard shift today. Um, so those of you who aren't um, new, who are returnees, and I can see from earlier chats online, um, there are plenty of you. Um, it's good to see you again. Um, so we'll begin. Um, I'm going to talk about digital ethics. Um, I'm going to divide it into two pieces. One is going to talk about what the problem is, and then the other piece is going to be presenting what's called the ethical OS. Um, so the ethical OS is a framework, really, that allows um, ICT departments to discuss and explore uh, potential issues uh, from, a digital, from a digital ethics perspective. Um, I suppose to give you an introduction to me, to those of you who don't know me, um, and so anybody who's been to uh, COSAC before will have some sense of, of who I am. This is just a quick overview of my background so you understand where I come from and why I talk about things like digital ethics, privacy ethics, and so on. So the first piece is I'm the COO of BH Consulting, which is a kind of niche consulting firm in data protection and cybersecurity. Um, and then I'm also doing a PhD in privacy um, and have been for quite some time, as many of you know, um, hoping to finish it up at uh, June 2021, everything going well. Um, so um, you'll be all pleased to know that, 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 that I'm hoping to finish it by then. My, pri my, my primary area of research is privacy in what's called a non-market environment. So that's corporate social responsibility, corporate political activity, and social political involvement. We're not going to be talking about that today. So, um, My aspirations and interests, I suppose, are to finish the PhD and then to fly at some point first class with Aer Lingus again, because it's just such a joy and it's my, my only um, luxury. Uh, and they've taken it away from me and I'm very annoyed about it. I suppose from a personal perspective, uh, I teach Tai Chi in my free time. And when I finish my PhD, I will be a back to being a golfer. My area of sort of expertise is 27001, 27701. And if anybody knows anything about Balbin's team roles, I am a resource investigator, which basically means if you want to know something, I'll go find it out, but I won't probably be able to do it. Okay, so that's me in a nutshell, uh, a quick whistle stop tour for those of you who don't know me. Um, so, you, so as you can kind of see, I'm about privacy, I'm about security, but from an ethics perspective, and I call it doing privacy right as opposed to doing privacy rights. Um, I suppose the reason I'm, I'm talking about digital ethics was in 2019, Gartner uh, had as their top 10 strategic technology trends, the only trend that they had that wasn't actually a technology was digital, digital ethics and privacy. Um, so, uh, they recognized that this was becoming a, a trend that needed to be addressed. But I also noticed that an awful lot of people didn't know anything about what exactly digital ethics were. So that's how this presentation was really born. The biggest issue, uh, again, with that is that thinking that it can be addressed, like many other privacy issues, with checklists. And checklists won't work with digital ethics. And we're going to talk about why. So the agenda really, as I've already discussed, is, is two parts. One is to discuss uh, what digital ethics are and how they come about. And the other is to talk about the ethical OS, this framework from the OMIDR network. So it's really two pieces uh, to a jigsaw puzzle. I don't provide any answers, quite frankly. It's, um, it's a nasty piece of research. I'm just presenting it to you. Uh, it's thought provoking. I hope 
that it kind of think about things in a different way. Um, it's essentially recognizing that the way we respond to privacy, the way we respond to technology issues right now at the moment is through legislation. We keep on incre increasing the stringency of regulation in the hope that that will resolve the problems. However, it's not going to resolve the problems because there are problems in, in, in that as a resolution. One of those problems is that technology is fast outpacing the rate of regulation. In other words, regulation takes about two years to go from thought to bill, and technology is advancing at a faster rate than that. And for those of you of a particular vintage, you might remember Lucille Ball. She it works in a factory with Betty in a chocolate factory, and they get a new electronic conveyor belt, and it produces chocolate far too quickly for them to box it. And Lucille turns around to Betty and says, I think we're fighting a losing game here, Betty. And it's the same principle with technology responding to with regulation. And if you think that it took, it took uh, 10 years for smartphones to penetrate 40% of US households compared to, say, the landline phones, that needed 30 years to reach 10% of US households. So that just gives you an idea of how quick technology is penetrating our lives. Another issue uh, that regulation cannot address properly is, is it's been asked to deal with concepts like is code speech in, in terms of AI and encryption. We see restrictions on the dissemination of encryption research results, raising questions of whether a computer program is protected speech and what kinds of protection it deserves. And these are very, very complicated questions where there's yes and no answers. Um, we see the same with grey areas where we have moral questions, moral dilemmas. Um, and so we have, for instance, I, I use the Edward Snowden one. Um, I believed that Edward Snowden at the time, we all know about his, his um, whistleblowing, I, I believed at the time that um, this was a brave step for, for a man to make um, in, in, to, in what he did at the time. Um, and. And then I met a speaker on the circuit who, who was from the US and he said, I don't want to share the stage with that man. And it was the first time I ever encountered somebody who actually had a partisan perspective to me. Um, and I realized then that I needed to find out more about it. And it's actually quite interesting, which is why I suppose I bring it to the first poll, which is, do you believe, and this is again, it's an entirely uh, personal opinion, um, and the reason I ask it is because, um, so we're going to have the first poll. The first poll should be there. Did Edward Snowden make the correct ethical choice? So maybe if uh, uh, people could take that first poll, I don't want to move on to the next slide till everybody's kind of taken that first poll. So there's only three answers really. It's a yes or a no, or you'd rather not say it's entirely up to you. It is completely anonymous. Um, but in truth, the Edward Snowden issue was, was quite partisan. In Europe, he was considered quite a hero. In the US, he was considered quite a traitor. Um, so it was quite a partisan view, and it's very difficult to regulate an area that's so gray that that's society can be divided by. And this socio-political issue is actually part of the privacy areas that I'm looking at is those partisan issues that are associated with privacy. And Edward Snowden represents them quite well. But you can see here that um, the Pew Research Center at the time um, had a, a divided view of Snowden's leak. So you can see Republicans and Democrats internally. So separate to the European versus American, we see that there's differences between Republicans versus Democrats in their support for Snowden's uh, leaking the information about the US government. So we have some sense of what the issues might be with using reg regulation um, to address the issue of how do we bridge the gap with ethics. And so looking at ethics, we need to think, well, technology doesn't have ethics. It's people that demonstrate ethics. It's people that actually create the technologies. So if we look at um, a very good example of where that happens is in Tay, Microsoft's AI chatbot. And Microsoft released Tay and within 24 hours had to pull Tay because Tay went from a beautiful human being, our, 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 our AI version, into full Nazi in 24 hours. That's uh, what 
Twitter said. Um, and um, all that Tay did was learn from tweets. Um, in China, Tay was very soft, very gentle, uh, very kind, very caring. And then in the US, uh, Tay was, was quite the opposite. They, that's not a reflection on cultures at all. Uh, it's more a reflection on freedom of expression um, on, on um, internet channels. And so, so we, we know, however, that uh, we see it's not the technology, it wasn't Tay. Tay was learning from the people in the technology. Technology also inherits the biases of its makers, and its makers aren't just individuals, they're organizations. And those organizations are led by leaders and those leaders create values. And so if we think of a very good example of, of this sort of value when it comes particularly to privacy, we see that the FTC appointed Mark Zuckerberg um, uh, to, uh, he that, uh, ordered uh, Facebook to appoint somebody to be responsible at a senior level for privacy. And Facebook responded by appointing a marketing exec, one of their longtime marketing execs. And that just gives you a sense of what uh, Facebook's values towards privacy are. And so they're obviously going to be built into their products when we look at what their values are as an organization. So what exactly is digital ethics? Um, we now know what the problems are with technology. We know, we know about the biases in, in technology. Let's talk now about what exactly is digital ethics. And the reason I say this is because there are so many definitions out there as to uh, what digital ethics are. And you go to talks and you're expecting to hear about digital ethics and you hear about something else. Ethics is, the dif is knowing the difference between what you have a right to do and what's right to do. That's ethics. We have business ethics, and that is really the ethical codes that an organization follows in, in its business. And, and outside of that, we also have privacy ethics, which is really just because you can doesn't mean you should. We have medical ethics, you know, consent-based, obviously fully informed, we have research ethics, um, pink Nuremberg trials. We have situational ethics, and, and that's really, you know, those little white lies. Um, but in terms of uh, what are digital ethics, I had to go and really kind of uh, do a dig deep in order to find out what the, defi what the definitions are, good definitions out there. So traditional ethics concerns relationships with individuals. Corporate ethics concerns relationships between companies and customers. Um, and this is from Luciano Floridi. Um, I'm not pronouncing his name right, I'm sure, but he's kind of considered the, the father of digital ethics. And, and combining the two, essentially, digital ethics blends both, and it applies to two or more parties interacting online. And it prescribes how individuals communicating online should behave. It also describes how corporations should responsibly conduct internet commerce and how companies should treat their customers. So that's essentially what digital ethics is. But I kind of thought, well, it's, it's, it doesn't give me all the meat that I needed. I looked at Wiki, by the way, and it basically says you can sell it as long as the terms and conditions say you can, as long as you don't affect the democratic process and as long as you can address surveillance and government issues. And I thought that's the wiki, um, but it's, it's, it's hardly detailed enough. So there's a missing piece. And so a further investigation from a book by the same name is that it's the field of study concerned with the way technology is shaping and will shape into the future our political, social, environmental and moral existence. And I kind of feel that that really does kind of um, summarize the essence of digital ethics. And then we find that um, at the World Ethical Data Forum, um, the Process Street Group and an advocacy group, they, they were arguing how we should employ technology, what risks new technology might bring, and what the arrival of those new futures means to us as humans on this little ball of dirt. And, and that, in essence, is what they believe to be digital ethics. But my preferred definition is, is Kapuro's from the book Digital Ethics. So if we look at organizations and we, we, we apply those definitions and we say, OK, Instagram, did Instagram actually know when it was created that there was going to be issues with likes, that people were going to be addicted, that it was going to create dopamine, uh, chemical reactions in their brain? Did they know that when they set out to create their product? 
Or is it something that evolved accidentally over time because it was a risk that they didn't anticipate? I'm not saying yes or no to, to these questions. I'm just saying organizations create products and they don't understand that those products may be misused in a way that they never foresaw. Did those organizations, when we think of the social media giants, did they know that they were going to become digital monopolies? and the impact that being a digital monopoly would have on society. And, and how can we as society regulate risks that we cannot yet conceive? And so all I'm trying to really build up to here is the issue that we have um, with technology um, as it currently is shaping our society. So I'll give you a little sort of look at what that technology looks like right across the world so you can get some sense of what issues might exist out there. So first of all, we have Badu, which is the Chinese search engine, think kind of the Google of China. And it's partnering with KFC to open a smart restaurant. So the, the smart restaurant has now opened in Beijing, which employs AI facial recognition. And it makes recommendations about what customers might order based on factors like their age, gender, facial expression, and it holds on to their previous order and orders based on trends, based on those previous orders. Now, that's taken some sense of autonomy away from my, my individual choices as a human being. And at the same time, I'm sure it's quite interesting um, to order from this system and, and fun. Um, yet it has implications beyond just the, what the product is delivering. We see emotion detecting artificial intelligence. The video game, never mind. I don't know if anybody's ever heard of it. It uses emotion-based biofeedback technology from a company called Effectiva to detect a player's mood. And it readjusts the game's levels and difficulty based on the assessment it makes of the player. So the more frightened the player, the harder the game gets. The more relaxed the player, the game gets easier. So you can imagine the amount of dopamine that's created, the chemical reactions in the brain that are created because of that, and how addictive that must become. We also have emotionally intelligent artificial intelligence. Um, we see Microsoft's Emotion API, which detects emotion from facial expressions. We have Web, Am Web Empath, which detects user speech emotions. And we have IBM's Watts, IBM Watson's Tone Analyzer, which uh, understands communication style in text. And so the IBM Tone Analyzer, um, it uses linguistic analysis to detect emotional and language tones in written text. And businesses can use the service to learn the tone of their customers' communications and to respond using bots, of course, to each customer appropriately and to understand and improve customer conversations. And essentially, I'm reminded of the phrase, if a marketer can get you to cry, he can get you to buy. Um, and then we have more, you know, we have other ones now, which is like Alexa. It can act on hunches based on voice emotion detection, and it can propose unprompted actions, recognizing you as tired, sick, or upset. So, for the vulnerable, this is a huge plus, and it alerts emotional, mental, and physical states of individuals. So you can straight away anticipate the real benefits of this emotionally intelligent artificial intelligence. However, when you're using voice to analyze more than is asked, you're, you're essentially heading into privacy and trust concerns because the relationship between you and technology and um, increases, the trust level increases in it because it actually recognizes you at emotional levels. So it's just something we need to be concerned about. What are the issues associated with too much trust? And this is one that I love. I think it's, um, it's incredible. I think it's, it's powerful, both in a positive and in a negative way. So for those of you who are from, I'll just start you go back. For those of you who are from um, non-European areas, you may not know the John Lewis Christmas ads. So John Lewis is a department store and their Christmas ads are really famous. Um, they always have something that will really dig deep into, you know, pull heartstrings and, and they are wonderful and everybody looks forward to the John Lewis ads starting the Christmas season, which is about October these days. Um, 
So it's it's Elton John essentially at a piano and a little boy, and, and you don't know that the little boy is Elton John. But realize um, it uses, it's a piece of software, it uses eye tracking and facial uh, expression and facial coding to analyze mood. And so it has kind of the gray points and red points. The gray are, are, are represent the negative reactions and the red points are the positive reactions. And they trace um, second by second reactions of a sample audience watching different videos. And, and they use this one as an example um, through their computer and smartphone camera. And then they give them a mark out of 10. And what was really interesting was the audience wasn't excited about seeing Elton John. They were gray with Elton John. But when Elton the child appears, the red line spikes. And, and this reflects exactly what you feel when you're looking at the ad. And yet it's been detected by a piece of AI. So you can see the absolute value that, that may have. But at the same time, maybe I don't want someone to know or something to know how I'm feeling. Maybe I would like that to remain private. That sense of autonomy that that we all need in order to function in society. And so that kind of gives you a sense of the background to what are the issues? What are the problems that we're seeing out there in the AI led world? What are the issues that we're encountering from a technical perspective and from an ethical perspective? And what are the differences then between the different perspectives of the ethics and, and the biggest focus being obviously in digital ethics? Now let's take a look at the ethical OS. So the Omijar network is a philanthropic network, obviously, who produce lots of pieces of research, but in the main, they produce things for society to use. And, and this is a publicly available framework that anybody can use in order to work with their team to determine what are the risks of this system that we're developing or this software that we're developing or this application that we're upgrading. What are the risks? beyond security risks, beyond your standard checklists, what are the risks that we might not be thinking about in the production of this um, piece of software or system? And, and it uses the digital ethics framework in order to build that tool. So it's a tool that anybody can use. And this just presents the eight dimensions of that tool so that it can show you how those eight dimensions can be explored. So it's made up of two parts. One is a sort of a, a how to, a, a read me kind of section. And then the other is the actual tool itself. And we're just gonna go through a very brief overview of the tool. Um, and again, it's they present with each kind of case study to show you what's happened in the past um, with these particular dimensions. So the, at the beginning of it, they ask you to ask yourself if the technology you're building right now will someday be used in unexpected ways, how can you hope to be prepared? What new categories of risk should you pay special attention to now? Um, which design teams or model business model choices can safeguard users, communities and societies and your company from future? Note those stakeholders are not just your company. So this, this is the, these are the eight risk zones. Um, and we're gonna go through each risk zone um, just to describe what those issues might be and how might you discuss them with your team. So the first one is truth, disinformation and propaganda. So what are the risks here? So these are not new risks and anybody who's of a particular vintage will remember Freddie Starr. I mean, this is back in 1986. The Sun carried this as its main headline and it was Freddie Starr ate my hamster. Freddie was allegedly supposed to have gone into his friend's house, asked for a sandwich. The friend said no. And so Freddie went into the kitchen, put the pet ham hamster called Supersonic, stuck it in between two slices of bread and ate it. Of course, it was untrue um, at the time that Freddie Starr denied it, but the result of it was that he got um, an increase in his fees for the show and tour that he was doing of over a million um, and, and boosted the number of dates for his tour. And the man who concocted the story, the hamster story, was the British publicist Max Clifford, who was at the time Starr's agent. So, so truth disinformation has existed for many, many years. However, the prol you know, it's prolific when it's on the internet and that is, um, and, and social media. So 
You need to ask yourself, could bad actors use your tech to subvert the truth? Could it be used to undermine trust? And, and all the speakers today have spoken about trust. And um, so could it be used to undermine trust in social institutions such as media, medicine, democracy and science? And I think there's some obvious ones there that, that have breached trust in those institutions, particularly democracy. Could this tech be used to generate misinformation, uh, create political distrust or destabilize governments? And what's the potential for fake news or deep fake videos using this technology? And so the obvious one that's affected many of those aspects has been Facebook. And we think about the Cambridge Analytica um, um, issue and how it affected society. 50 million accounts. We all know that they were, um, they were shaped, their views were shaped. Um, for, so 50 million people. Um, uh, the invasion on so many aspects, but particularly democracy and, and the change to, to the democratic process that was involved there. Um, so that's just Facebook. You also have the capacity now to create what are called living portraits just from a picture. And so we can see that AI is now able to create what are living portraits from um, a simple picture. That's been taken one step Forward. I don't know if anybody's ever watched this TED talk. Unfortunately, using this platform, we can't show you the video, but it is an amazing uh, few minutes of TED talk. Um, and it is, I'm, I'm not going to pronounce the surname, but uh, Super Soren is what we're going to call him. And he talks about the technology that, that his team created, which is in fact the creating of those, those living portraits. He takes it one step further by, by creating what are called living histories. So the intention of his, his research was to create a technology, which is the technology I've just showed you, taking a picture and converting it into a moving video, um, adding sound to it um, and being able to actually bring a portrait to life. And he did it for the purpose of bringing um, Holocaust victims stories and uh, living testimonies is what it was called um, to bring those testimonies to life so rather than just have them in writing but then he talks about the untold uh, amount of positives that could come from it and the untold amount of negatives but that they didn't think about the negatives only the positives when they set out on developing this so for instance he talks about imagine if you could uh, pick any lecture, any subject, and have Richard Feynman um, do the, the, the presentation or the lecture. Um, imagine if you could have your favorite author read your book. Imagine if you could hear loved ones talk to you as you, you did in the past. These are all the wonderful um, things that he has spoken about. But then he presents four pictures of Obama talking at a conference and asks which one is the real Obama, and none of them are. Um, so. Um, what is it when you spoil the end of a movie? Um, I, I think I've just done that anyway. Um, spoiler alert. So sorry, I've given you the spoiler alert. Uh, but it's worth a watch. Um, so the next risk is addiction and the dopamine economy. Again, another one that's, that's you know, really close to all our hearts, particularly those of us who have children and, and have children using social media. Uh, but the questions to ask are, does the model benefit from maximizing user attention and engagement? Is that good for the mental, physical and social health of users? What does extreme use or addiction or unhealthy use actually look like? And how can you encourage healthy use? So there's sneaky ways apps like Instagram, Facebook and Tinder lure you in and get you addicted. So we know, for instance, um, one of the things is the pulling down screen to refresh. In other words, you pull down a screen to refresh. And, and it was only when I was reading up about um, sort of digital ethics that I discovered that this, in fact, is very similar to the slot machine and the process we follow with the slot machine in pulling down. We pull down to see if there's anything new there. And then we have stopping queues. Um, those stopping queues don't exist anymore. If you think about your, your Facebook feed is endless. So it, it actually doesn't have an end. It's not like you ever reach the end of the page. So the stopping queues have been removed, just like in casinos where the daylight has been removed, where you have no windows and you have no clocks. So the stopping queues have been removed. And then we've got like FOMO and streaks and likes, and these are all designed to get us increasingly addicted and to lure us in. 
a study on Facebook was done, which was really interesting, again, about how we are emotionally connected when we're online. So it was often thought that social media wasn't emotionally connecting. In other words, we could go in and we could go out. But it turns out um, a, a very large study has um, provided evidence, found evidence that um, I am emotionally affected by your emotional state in social media. So that if you feel down, I feel down, as it might be if we were physically sitting beside each other. And then we see sort of addiction and, and, and the effect of addiction. So in China, Tencent, which is their, their, their biggest gaming and social media firm by revenue, Tencent had a game called Honor of Kings. And a number of children actually ended up either very ill or, in fact, one committing suicide in one time um, from actually not moving um, because they were so addicted. And so they now limit the playtime for some young users um, at at an organizational level rather than at a parental level. So then the next one is economic and asset inequality. So who will or won't have access to this tech? Will those without suffer? What does your tech create, collect or disseminate? In other words, you know, what about health data, virtual currency, deep AI? Who has access and who can monetize it and who gets recompensed for it, which is really important um, in terms of building trust with consumers. Are you replacing labor with this technology? And are you going to create weight by, wealth by doing that? What's the impact of reduced employment on the economic well-being and social stability? And is there ways to turn that around and create an alternative social stability um, if you are replacing labor? And are there other ways that tech can contribute to the economic security, if not through employment? I we'll see a really good example of this for MPSA. Not too sure how to pronounce that, but I think it's MPSA, which is online mobile, sorry, mobile banking and mobile banking apps. Um, and we see that in uh, very sort of remote African countries, uh, remote African towns, um, uh, particularly in poor ones, that they didn't have access to banking. There was no banks nearby. And so money was earned manually, it was in cash. And often what was found was that uh, particularly women and, and mothers to families were not getting money because um, the, the earners of the money were not given the money to those individuals. And so there was huge poverty created, even though money was being earned, it wasn't being distributed amongst the community. And, and now we find that with mobile banking, that money can be placed into accounts and that these women became more empowered through the, the availability of having access to banking. Um, so this is really important in terms of progressing a community and society. Um, so now we see, for instance, that much technology is not available to the poor. So we see that, um, for instance, iPhones are, are, are have yet to break into the African market in the way that, say, Android has broken into that market. And that's because you pay so much for an iPhone in comparison to, say, other uh, cheaper models. Um, so that's, you know, privacy then becomes something that belongs to the wealthy rather than the poor. And that's a, not it's rather flippant, but it's, um, it's a, sort of a, a reflection on poorer countries don't have access necessarily to the technology that we expect as Western countries that we have. We also see that um, certain products, like say for instance, car insurance is um, it's cheaper for white people than it is for black people because of biases. So um, the next one then is machine ethics and algorithm biases. And these are um, really common um, and there's something that we we're all aware of, we've all been talking about. Um, yet do we ask those questions when we're developing tools in our organization? Um, do we ask if we're using AI data sets, are there historical biases in the data? Is there possibility of individual bias or reinforcing bias in the algorithms that we're developing? What's the diversity of those developing the algorithm and how are you achieving that diversity? Um, in other words, have you addressed implicit bias 
in your interview process? Have you addressed implicit bias in um, your uh, development of, of senior management process? You know, so it, within your organization, have you addressed diversity? Um, how do you push back, push back against the assumption that AI is correct? You know, there is that assumption that AI is correct and that there's no need to audit it. So how do you push back against that assumption? And are algorithms transparent to those who are impacted? In other words, is there recourse for those incorrectly or unfairly assessed? And in some legal jurisdictions, that's more available than others when transparency is mandated through privacy legislation. But in other, in other um, jurisdictions, it isn't. So you cannot assume that the recourse is available there for everybody. So we can see that in algorithms, we, we, we know that there is a struggle to recognize black faces equally. Um, and the facial recognition software used in the US, Australia, France, checking cruise passenger faces landing in the US by border protection records. And um, in Denia is the name, their algorithm doesn't see all faces equally. NIST tested the algorithms and two photos showing the same face, similar to how a border agent would check passports, and um, falsely matched different white women's faces at a rate of one to 10,000. And it was 10 times more frequent than that in, in black women's faces. We also see that um, Google uh, photo um, identification, automatic photo identification, their algorithm and um, this was back in 2017 or 2018, I think, um, mistakenly categorized black faces as gorillas. And obviously they pulled it. Um, uh, it, was, um, it was related to bias in an algorithm um, and not something that I'm sure Google were terribly proud of. Um, so if we look across, we've got facial recognition AI increasingly being used by police and MIT researchers found three gender recognition AIs could correctly identify a person's gender from a photograph 99% of the time, but only for white men. For dark skinned women, accuracy dropped to 35%. In Compass and the US, um, it guides sentencing by predicting likelihood of reoffense. ProPublica reported that Compass was racially biased. Its research found that SIP's system predicts that black defendants posed a higher risk of recidivism than, than they actually did. And it was the reverse for white defendants. And PredPol in the US predicts where crimes will take place. And essentially, um, it repeatedly sent officers to neighborhoods with a high proportion of racial minority regardless of the true crime rate, um, because Fred Paul learns from police reports and it, it basically has built in a feedback loop of racial bias. And so now we have IBM producing a 10 kind of state of the art anti-bias mitigation, uh, or sorry, bias mitigation algorithms. And so they have listed them, they're listed here. Um, but there's a whole series of different types of biases that we have. So racial bias just being one of those. Um, and the idea is that when you create an algorithm, you run it through these anti-bias tools, and then it will assess whether um, that particular algorithm scores on these uh, particular biases. So risk number five is a surveillance state. So in the surveillance state, you want to be asking, can government military use this technology to monitor and infringe citizens' rights? Can others do this? Who are those others? Who's tracking? Is it okay to do this tracking? How might governments use or abuse this data? And are you forced to submit this data? And does the tech create data that can follow users throughout their lifetime? Can it affect their reputation or impact their future or their freedoms? And who do you not want to use your data and how can you prevent it? So in the surveillance state, which is a, it's a really interesting area. So we're going to move into poll two. Um, poll two is national surveillance for the purpose of security acceptable where it infringes the constitutional right to privacy. And again, um, poll two, I have some, some polls that were already done that, that presents the um, summaries of, of those polls. So I would love to have us compare our polls to those polls. 
Um, so if everybody wants to just respond to those polls. And then I'm going to give a quick look all around the world, what we see as surveillance issues and, and how were these surveillance uh, products, if you want to call them that, would they have, would someone or would teams have created these discussions about those um, pieces of surveillance prior um, to implementing them? So obviously we've got the Foreign Intelligence Surveillance Act, okay? We also have in Italy, um, all Italian credit card transactions are uh, monitored by the Italian government and then they're correlated with um, your revenue returns to see that there isn't any uh, disparities between what you're spending and what you're declaring as your income. Um, we have um, the US Executive Order 1233. We have uh, Finland's National Tax Day, which is the 1st of November, where everybody's tax returns are published. You only need to know their name and address and you can ring up or you can check online and ask to see and you get to see their income, their credits, anything you want to know about them. They've almost zero social welfare fraud as a result and Finnish people are very happy with that um, and that was the intention of it. And yet, you know, ask any Irish person, uh, would they be okay with that? The answer would be absolutely no, they'd be shocked. In the UK, uh, we have uh, facial recognition trials being backed by the Home Secretary. Um, we have Singapore uh, checkpoints. We'll have fingerprint scans by 2025 as part of the AI push. Uh, in our own hometown in, in Ireland, we had the Department of Employment Affairs and Social Protection, which spans quite an array of different sectors, different public sectors, wanting to introduce public service card, which would basically be a one card fits all, um, a, a similar type of surveillance. If we look at COVID, which is an interesting one right now in terms of surveillance, quick, uh, super quick actually, uh, view of the world on COVID with Turkey. Uh, they've got a GPS-based centralized app, which is uh, registering all COVID affected people mandator mandatorily. Uh, Kyrgyzstan, we have a similar one, which was originally based on consent, but it is mandatory now. China, uh, hardly a surprise. Um, it's got drones, CCTV cameras, monitoring, quarantine people. Um, other nations, Singapore, South Korea, Israel, are also using a combination of uh, drones, video footage, credit card information to track COVID in their countries. And the electronic Frontier Foundation said governments should not be granted these powers unless they can show the public how these powers would actually help in a significant manner to contain COVID. And, and you know, in terms of the ethical OS, I don't see those conversations happening about surveillance. So if we go to three, uh, so again, this is about invasion of privacy. So I, I have um, another series of poll results on this one. So back in uh, 2016, um, FBI refused to hand over the keys to the kingdom or, or basically help the FBI in gaining access to a known terrorist mobile phone. Um, so they did so uh, refusing to, as they cited that it was an invasion of privacy and it was a step in the wrong direction. Um, and so just in terms of, of your opinion, did Apple make the correct choice in refusing to comply with the orders from the FBI to provide access to the terrorist mobile phone? Again, it'd be just interesting to see what that looks like to see, does it look like the actual poll results um, from Pew? Oops. So hopefully everybody will have completed that poll. So let's look at what Pew said. Well, Pew said that 51% of American US participants said um, that Apple should have unlocked the phone. So more than half said Apple should have unlocked the phone. 38% said should not unlock the phone. Then when you widen beyond the US, and, and so uh, MarketWatch did an internet uh, survey. I'm not, um, I, I don't know anything about the methodology in this survey. Q, I can say, will follow a pretty robust methodology, so I know nothing about this one. Um, but it was 13,000 respondents. Um, so 60% said no, where 36% said yes, they should have. And then when we look internally and we analyze internally, we see 
that uh, 37% of Republicans um, agreed uh, with the court order um, and Democrats 54%. Um, again, we see in being asked the question, the government should be able to look at data on American smartphones in order to protect them against terror threats. 53% of Republicans agreed and 46% versus 46% of Republicans. So you can see that there's differences there between um, the US and the rest of the world and internally between Republicans and Democrats in terms of perspectives on surveillance. So data control and monetization, we're getting there, we're nearly there. Um, do users have the right to access data you collect easily? If you profit from the use, do you share those profits? Can users monetize their data independently? What could bad actors do with this data if they had access to it? What's the worst thing someone could do with this data if it was stolen or leaked? And what plan or policy for customer data do you have if your organization is merged, bought or sold, etc.? Which is a place, I mean, mergers and acquisitions is a place where we see a lot of privacy issues occurring. So we see, for instance, there's a social network uh, called Steemit, um, and basically it rewards users for likes and comments and any posts um, with a fraction of a digital currency called Steam. And then over time, Steam accumulates and you can cash it out for normal currency or you can bank it if you want to invest in Steam itself. And it, you know, for each um, for each of these uh, sections, these risks in in the tool, it gives you scenarios. And and so I didn't include the scenarios in this. We just don't have enough time. But this one is one that I like. It says, you know, are you ready for a world in which? And so this one is, are you ready for a world of smart toilets? You know, that can detect stress hormones, pregnancy, infectious diseases, a whole series of other things. And according to <clears throat> the contract. Participants must sign in order to get the smart toilet. Data can be collected from these smart toilets and used for any purpose without limitation, including being sold to third parties. You know, are you ready for that kind of a world where you where you, you're transferring that kind of information? Um, which I thought was was rather interesting. Okay, and then uh, implicit trust and user understanding. Again, trust is mentioned um, in almost all of the sessions this morning. Does the tech do anything that users would be surprised at? And if so, why is it not made explicit? Would it be a backlash, essentially? Val, sorry to interrupt. Um, we've got a long list of questions uh, waiting for you. Um, okay, and we're three minutes I'm over. there. Way to wrap up in, within five. I can, yeah. Thank you very much. Okay. Um, so on trust, uh, we have uh, GDPR, obviously, and it's trying to engage with consumer trust. So on COVID, it mandates that we produce the DPIA and we get to see inside uh, the COVID tracker app as a result. And um, so, so some legislation can, in fact, lend insight into uh, that um, the no surprises element. And then finally, um, hateful and criminal actors. Can someone use your tech to bully, stalk, or harass? Can, what kind of new ransomware, theft, or financial crimes or legal acts could arise from your tech? Could organized groups use your tech to spread hate? And what would hate look like on your platform? And can your tech be weaponized? So if we think about Facebook, you know, the, the, the Charlottesville driver, Facebook was used uh, to create, the, to, to, to arrange that. We have Airbnb cancelling accounts linked to white white nationalist rallies. Um, and, and we also find that not only can it be bad, but it's good. We have Twitter bots, okay? So in Twitter bots, some of them are actually good. We have found that uh, good tweets spread just as quickly as bad tweets. And, and so health apps, research has, has implemented health apps that can apply right across um, a number of different um, social media uh, mechanisms, channels. Um, and, and they'd be very effective at being used for good. So early adopters of the ethical OES, ethical OES is a company called Terra Fusia who are producing the flying car. Okay, so there's the flying car and they're using the ethical OS to determine what the risks might be. Okay, and we also have Mozilla and Techstars and other 
companies like that who are also um, using it to determine what the risks might be. Um, and, and this was one from last year that I saw, and, and they could well use with using the ethical OS, but there's um, microchips, a, a, a company in the UK that um, is developing microchips that you can use, put into your fingers the size of a, a grain of rice and use to access your buildings. And I thought it was, it was quite a, a fantastic idea, but add a bit of um, geolocation into that and it, it could be misused by employers to know where their employees are. And so essentially, that's pretty much it. Um, it's as quick as I could get us there, David. Um, and so I think we're into question time. We are. Thank you very much indeed, Val. As always, extremely insightful, uh, not just for the COSAC group, but for the world at large, I think. Um, so we do have a, a long list of questions. Um, you have to smell a rat when the top of the list of popular questions is, in fact, from just down the street. Um, and, a, and a good friend in Richard Nealon. So we're just trying to get Richard on stage. Um, what did you think of the poll results while we're waiting for Richard? Did you see, a, I think I detected quite a difference between the security community's opinions and public opinions um, in the yeah. answers to those polls. But uh, yeah, oh, think, Richard's on stage, sorry. Over to you, Richard, you ask your question first. I think so, Daryl. I, I think one of the things, uh, the interesting one for me was the the poll on, on Snowden, because uh, I, I think the better question is, was it an ethically good decision for him? Um, and I think that's where, the, where the, the difference is. People understand that it's not an ethically good decision for them, but for him, it was probably the, the, the decision that he was most comfortable in making. Um, that Oops. All right. The question I had for that was in terms of culture. Is, is ethics the underlying principle for culture? And if it is, then if we can understand a company's ethical position, do we then get an insight into what their culture is? And as I was thinking more through that question and through your presentation, I was thinking it's probably no easier to get an insight into a company's um, ethical stance than it is into their culture. Any comments on that, Val? Well, I, I suppose I'd go back um, to the definition of digital ethics. So the ethical OS is really looking at digital ethics. Um, a company's ethical culture, uh, you get full insight into their ethical culture if they have corporate social responsibility reports or corporate social responsibility sites uh, where the, you get a sense of their ethical values. And um, so they usually publish a code of ethics. So that code of ethics will um, incorporate corporate ethics and it will also be environmental ethics and it will be social ethics. Um, and so there'll be a number of different pillars, privacy normally falling into the social pillar. Um, but digital ethics is specific to the development of systems, new systems where we don't know what future risks might be. That's what the digital ethics space is. Not to be confused, if you know what I mean, with uh, privacy ethics or corporate ethics or codes of ethics, if you know what I mean. Does that answer your question? Yeah, it does. Thanks very much, Val. Thanks a lot, Richard. Thanks and, to see and you. Person wearing the shirt makes it wonderful. Uh, so next up, we have Carol Coster. Over to you, Carol. Hi, Val. How are you? I'm good, Carol. Nice to see you. Nice to see you too. Hey. Well, hey, a breach of ethics is often defined by the victim's experience and not by the intent of the party that breaches it. And ethics can be breached with good intent. But how do you test this in a digital realm where feedback and impact is often not easy to gather? Um, I, it's, it's a great question. I mean, ethics, uh, what's ethical in my view may not be ethical in somebody else's view. And so the idea is that using um, a tool uh, such as a framework like the ethical OS that you can explore in a diverse community everybody's perspectives about what future ethical issues may be. You may say you don't think that that surveillance is an issue 
and your colleague may say, well, I do, and then you know, because you've got this diverse team, that you have a partisan ethical issue to deal with. In other words, you may be looking at providing a solution for both. Do you get me? Yep, I do. Thanks. Thank you very much, Carol. Appreciate the question. Uh, well, we have a, a new stage question next from Tiernan Hick, who says, while having digital ethics in the evolving information age is a necessity, how do you see this being policed globally when there will always be certain individuals, organizations, or states that won't operate within any ethical regulations that are adopted by the majority? And so I think, um, I think it goes back right to the very beginning of the presentation. It's almost impossible to regulate ethics. And uh, you know that um, it's, if we take GDPR as a very simple example, there's a space in GDPR about interpretation. It's how do you interpret it? And Buterelli, who was the, um, who was the head of the uh, European Data Protection Commission for many, many years, and, and really the father of the GDPR, uh, Lord Reston, um, he said that the, the only way for data protection and privacy to work is if we adhere to the spirit of the law rather than the letter of the law. So that goes back to checklists. So if we're focusing on ethics um, as being something that we can checklist, we will never get it right. Um, will there be people who do wrong, who breach ethics? Absolutely. I mean, the world wouldn't be the world if, if it didn't exist, but at least we'll be able to make a value judgment by comparing them to those who do. So, you know, you'll be able to get to see, well, um, so for instance, I, on ethics, Google, um, 10 years ago, the then CEO, Eric Schultz, said that Google get right up to the creepy line, but they never cross it. And it's an expression I love, which means we won't breach your ethical kind of perspective, but we will get very, very close to it. And, and I think that's a really, really good way of, um, a, a maximum profit is to be had right up there at that line. Uh, but, but Facebook breached the line. Um, and so, you know, I, I think that people will, or organizations will always breach the line, but I don't think it will be all organizations. And I think it would be unfair to say that we need to operate on the assumption that all organizations are going to breach the ethical codes that we have implemented and expect to be implemented. Great question, Tiernan, and great answer as always, Val. Uh, next up, we have Shan back again. Welcome back, Shan. Hello. Uh, yes. Hi, Shan. Hey, how are you doing? Uh, so, yeah, my question was sort of really repeating in a way the question that David asked me in my presentation. And given the fact you were even showing the different attitudes between those of us doing the surveys and, uh, and general public, is there any way we can ever get any sort of universal basic ethics, or does it have to be very specific to different experiences? Well, um, so uh, so if we take a very simple example, so I'm going to give you a, a, what I think is a simple example, which is the view in the US of national surveillance versus the view in the EU of national surveillance. In the US, um, and, and so it's about approaches to invasion of privacy. Um, here, we have built um, a, a, a view of privacy that's based on a series of dictatorships. That's our history, is a series of dictatorships. And within those dictatorships, our privacy was invaded and repeatedly misused um, to identify vulnerable members of communities or, or to create genocide or whatever. That's our history. And, and so we go out of our way to avoid that again. We don't want to have our privacy invaded, but we don't have 9-11. And so when you look to the US, now they have terrorist attacks. That's their history. And within the context of their history, that's what they don't want to happen again. And so what one considers ethical in one framework, the other doesn't. And so you have these two opposing views, but they're both born out of historical contexts. And most of our ethical views are born out of historical contexts. So it's very difficult to find a, a one uh, fits all. I, I don't think we'll ever find that. Okay, thank you. 
Thank you very much, Sharon. Uh, next question is uh, again off stage, all the way from Alex Parkinson. It must be dinner time in Australia by now, Alex, but thank you for your question. He says, Conway's law talks about a system structure reflecting the organizational structure of the builder. Do we need or will we ever have an equivalent law about the digital ethics and the systems we build? How close are we to having this as a simple, easily understood statement? So if you go back to the previous answer, we'll never be able to have a, a one law fits all. That will never be possible. But we see an awful lot of um, a guidelines for AI development and, and ethical AI development. So Google have them, Microsoft have them, IBM have them. There's a series of different guidelines. So we're not going to be able to, I think, produce laws, but we certainly will be able to produce codes that may reflect the local zeitgeist, if that's the right thing. But I think it will always be very difficult to have a one code fits all because it's um, ethics is is so different, vastly different in, in each and different uh, in every culture, gender, political uh, leaning and affiliation. There's so many different aspects and we find that people are, are, are different ethics within each of those separate sections. So the same will apply in digital ethics. Thank you very much. Um, while we're waiting on, on Ryan Manship to take the stage, I noticed a, a comment from Shar Sample. Um, let's just scroll off the screen. We can have universal understanding, but even that will not be consistently comprehended. Um, it would be nice to get Shar on stage to talk about that. But meantime, uh, Ryan has joined us. Uh, great to see you, Ryan. Over to you. Hey, yeah, is this working? It is. Cool. Hi. Uh, so, okay, my question was around, you know, this concept of intended use, right? So um, we, we hear some of the kind of marketing talk about how these different features are intended to be used, what the good things are, and then there's kind of the EULA, if you will, it says how else they're gonna do everything, and then there's what they really do. You know, there seems to be a lot of a disconnect between those things, and, and oftentimes the marketing uh, description is you know, very positive, very, you know, with the, helping you be more healthy or more happy or, you know, these kinds of things. But in reality, you know, it's being sold and used for manipulation or, or whatever it is, right? I, I'm just wondering, is it, do you see there's anything we can do about this or is there some way to at least align what's actually happening with what we're being told? Um, well, I think, so, so legislation can go some of the ways and that is with transparency laws. So GDPR um, produces, um, or, or mandates that you state what you're going to use the information for, and then you cannot veer from that. You can have secondary purpose as long as it's related, um, but you need to be clear about that secondary purpose. So you have to have full transparency. And, and so if you get my consent, and marketing usually relies on consent, if you get my consent, it must be fully informed. So no, difficult, no different to medical consent, that consent must be fully informed. Um, but GDPR doesn't apply everywhere. Um, so I cannot say how that consent can be collected in other jurisdictions. Um, but I don't think, I think if you talk to marketing people, marketing people will say things like, and it's quite amusing. They will say, I'm collecting this information so that I can give you a better personalization experience. I'm doing it for you. And that's what I think is the most amusing piece of the marketers perspective. They're not doing it for me. They're doing it for them. And uh, the benevolence, is, they're, they're not benevolent towards me, but they will tell me that it is. And I think that, that when marketers start to say, we're doing this because we want your information, because we want to sell your information, and because we want to use that information to maximize our profit, but we're going to give you something in return. A bit like sort of the Google model. Um, when they start to get into that space, I think we'll trust them more, because we'll actually know that they're being upfront. Um, I, I don't think there's any way to account for, so it's back to that same old, same old, to account for organizations who breach laws or who breach codes. I don't think we can, we can sort that. Um, but I think that laws can certainly provide a certain level of minimum expectancy for the likes of marketers who continuously conceal from us what they're doing. And the GDPR certainly did go a huge ways towards ensuring that. Thank you. 
Great question, Ryan. Uh, looks like next up we have Mr. Patrick Wheeler. Welcome, Patrick. Thank you, thank you. Uh, very quick question, Valerie. Uh, one of the definitions of ethics that I liked very much uh, spoke to how we treat the, the least among us or the least well represented among us. And I think you did a good job of talking about people with darker skin, uh, women and men, but there's a lot of other people that are non-normative. And is that even uh, entering into the discussion point? Uh, people who have difference in cognition or, or you know, so yeah. some real fundamental differences from the norms and how we will treat yeah. that to ensure that we have a, a ethical digital representation. So it's a, it's a really good question. And I, I suppose it's, it's in a word in my presentation and the word that it's in is diversity. And so I say that we must have diverse teams in order to develop uh, those algorithms and those tools. We have to have diverse teams. And, and it's in that diversity um, we find sort of the neuroid diverse, we find the gender diverse, we find the, um, the racial diverse, we find, the, you know, age diverse, we find so many um, diverse pieces in that when we have diverse teams so that we're going to develop tools that meet diverse teams. So what's really interesting is Microsoft have a really good um, diversity program. And as a result of their diversity program being really, really good, they're now producing tools. They have a wonderful Xbox for um, people who have um, ability challenges because it was developed by people with ability challenges. And so we see that they're developing tools that address those ethical concerns of of losing those more vulnerable members of society. Um, so I, I, I don't think it answers your question as such, but it, it just sort of forms to demonstrate that organizations are thinking ethics at the first level of diverse teams in order to produce diverse products that are available to diverse people. Does that answer your question, Patrick? Absolutely, thank you, well done, thank you. Thank you for the question. Uh, next up, um, joining us from Singapore. Good to see you, Andreas. It's Andreas Banner. Hey, how are you going, Gary? Good to see you. Uh, thanks for a great presentation. Uh, the question I had was like, and I think from the feed and the discussion uh, in the chat, um, so ethics seem to be kind of bound uh, within context, right? There seem to be different views across the, the world and the cultures. So the question that I have is then, how is an organization addressing the dilemma of operating across regions with different aspects and you know deciding for them how they're going to address that with a different views and expectations? I think it's not easy. It's not easy, but I think that um, in, in the in the Nirvana organization, let's take um, the the organization that doesn't probably exist, but if there were to be the perfect organization, they would they would say. These are our values as an organization. So they would state what their values are. And, and within those values, then they would say to clients all across the world, these are our values and you can either like them or you can't do business with us if you don't like our values. And we respect an organization more if they're very clear about their values. Um, if we go back to, um, it was Google moving into China with do no evil and making uh, making information universally accessible. And um, in that space, Google found it very difficult to compromise their values because they needed to make information universally inaccessible in China. And so Badu took over that space as a result. And, and they stuck with their, their um, well, for some time anyway, they did. And then Badu had already taken over by the time they compromised. But, you know, um, at the time, they did stick by their values. So when an organization sticks by its values, we tend to regard it more, but they tend to lose market share. Right. Um, so um, it's it depends on how greedy a company is. You know, how big do you want to be? If you want to be global, 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 um, then you're going to have to compromise your values because you cannot be all things to all men. Yeah, I understand. Thank you. Thanks, Andreas. Uh, we've got Dimitri on camera this time. Have you got audio, Dimitri? Uh, no? I can't see. If you have audio, I can't we, hear can, we can hear you. We can hear you. <laughs> okay. I cannot speak. 
<laughs> okay, uh, Dimitri's uh, latest question is. Oh, okay, <laughs> but it's, it's, it's very hard to ask questions uh, like in silence. So, mm, I, I I think I will just disconnect and try to reboot or something like that. <laughs> That's I can read your question for you, Dimitri. No problem. Uh, it says I think it seems that we're becoming intolerant under the flag of tolerance. That yeah, is, we are realizing I that a paradox of tolerance, which states that if a society is tolerant without limit, its ability to be tolerant is eventually seized or destroyed by the intolerant. For example, the current trend of replacing words, to me, it seems to be a superficial response that gives the visibility of action without actual change. Isn't it a danger that we're moving towards surrogate ethics? That was a very long question. I don't know what's that a question. <laughs> Are we moving towards <laughs> surrogate ethics? <laughs> Bottom line. Well, surrogate ethics, um, because of intolerance. It depends on who's intolerance. I mean, are we as consumers becoming intolerant, or is it organisations are becoming intolerant of our demands as users? I, I don't know which side that's referring to. I think Dimitri's point is is almost a politically correct question is that in defining when intolerant people or societies define what is tolerant that they are uh, surrogating our definition of ethics such as in the substitution of allowable words in speech yeah um and so if that goes back to a little bit of the autonomy of organizations and organizations having their own will so to speak um, and so we have this sense of you kind of have um, uh, an organization that knows what its values are and sticks by those values won't really be affected by another nation's or another organization's intolerance. And um, so um, it, it requires an organization not to want to move into those territories. I don't really know if that's the answer. Um, I think it's a it's a conversation that could run for a long time. I'd say that requires a few drinks. <laughs> All right. Well, we'll have a few drinks in just a minute. We'll, we'll leave the last question to uh, the great John O'Leary, who, who can't join us on stage. His question is, hi, Valerie, do we think we will ever be able to get those who benefit from these controlling technologies to voluntarily give them up or even limit their own power? So uh, is that the organizations who own them? Uh, well, he said those who benefit from the technology, so there's an inference that it includes the makers of the technology. Well, interestingly enough, um, the makers are, are of the technology, so um, the um, Apple, um, for instance, um, uh, Tim Cook said that there are certain things he wouldn't let his children do on social media. Um, CEO of Google the same, he has restrictions in place. So these people know about um, the effects and the negative effects that social media have on children, and yet they're still peddling it to children. So one would want to ask, um, do they want to give it up? And there's a sense uh, of, well, surely if they know then why don't we know? Well, I think they know things that we don't know. And we need research te teams in universities to do the studies on them, to bring us that information. And then we know, but they know about it already because they've already done that work. And I think the piece that's missing is we'll never give up something that's benefiting them financially. It's very, very difficult for somebody to give up a golden goose, and but will they, you know, um, it's like the head of Kilbeg and whiskey is in fact a teetotaler. And I often kind of think to myself, what does he know that I don't know? You know, he doesn't drink anything. He doesn't drink alcohol and yet he makes whiskey. And um, so it's the same thing. I, I don't think they'll ever give it up, but I think what's happening um, more and more now that we're becoming aware, digitally ethically aware, as we become more and more ethically aware, it's incumbent on us as 
professionals in the field to bring that knowledge to those who don't know that. You know, so for instance, I would talk to schools about the addiction capacities and what that looks like and how to protect their privacy and ethics and privacy and what's right and what's wrong and what they should and what they shouldn't do. You know, it's incumbent on us to bring that forward to lay people who will never know what that is. And then at least they're armed to make decisions about whether they want to or go. But I, I don't think the, the owners will ever give it up. It's too lucrative. Not unless forced to do so. Um, thank you very much, Lee Val. Um, wonderful presentation as always, very thought provoking, which is what we love at COSAC. A um, couple of references to drinks, so I'm taking a hint and going to wind it up here. Um, thank you all very much, particularly Shan, um, Chris, Andy, and Val, for presenters for the first ever day of, of COSAC Connect. Uh, the networking lounge will open in a second, and uh, we still have free seats available. So if you'd like to continue those discussions um, in a more intimate environment, please feel free to join us. Um, for now, thank you all very much indeed. I hope that gives you a, a good flavour of the depth and of feeling and content that we like to provoke at COSAC. And we hope we will uh, see you all tomorrow in a very different time frame. So see you all tomorrow night and thanks everybody very much. See you in the morning. See you guys.